box. OK, so anyone who can hack this RF transmitter or has a frequency meter, I'm quite sure you can switch my slides uh, instead of me. Uh, this is definitely the kind of technology. Uh, uh, I wouldn't bet anything on crypto in there. OK, so thank you for not, thank you for not leaving massively this room. And uh, let us then start uh, with uh, basically a little history of uh, what and why telecom have been um, hacked for so long. So who in this room uh, may have known some friend who did this kind of stuff? OK, Man. good, you're <laughs> mature. <laughs> OK, great. Um, so of course, we've seen a lot of people uh, doing it back in the old days great tales about beige boxing and uh, about uh, doing this kind of really low level OK, the, thing. the uh, blue boxing, we're going to leave all the details to Captain Crunch, who's sitting over here, of course. And kudos to him. Um, and he's the one who created virtually the whole industry, so we are not going to talk about it today. But let's just say that it was a way to abuse early in-band signaling systems before out-of-band signaling systems were introduced. And why is that? People didn't believe in telcos that someone would actually play crazy tones in his phone. So they were really a customer, as I told you, to availability and stuff like that. But would there be bad people? And uh, basically, their focus was maybe at the wrong place. So they had to change. Uh, things change. And this is the bottom line about telco security. They always assume that their network is secure and no one else is playing there. So same thing for payphone. You know the US red box, right? Simulating tones that you, you say you have some money into the payphone, or you entered some. But in France, people got smart. They got like, oh man, since people get into the payphone and rob the payphone, and uh, also we can't trust money in there, we're going to sell telecart, this kind of little card that you insert into uh, the payphone and you just pay at the maybe next bar or whatever. Uh, well, how to make charging? So they were sending little tones the same way but reverse. So the tones were going to the card saying, okay, you have one less credit, okay, you have one less credit. Who can identify this kind of circuit? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, guys. Oh, this is a challenge. Nobody? OK, low pass filter. So you just need to put that on the line. And who suddenly not this 19 kilohertz tone is flowing in to get the telecart decredited. OK, so this was the French carte rouge, or boîte rouge, which is our equivalent of the red box. Once again, nobody in telco would assume that there would be an hostile person. Same for the PBXs. The PBXs, you know, they are basically private extension to, uh, to an exchange, and they are used by corporations to basically have telecom lines for their companies. And the vendors of PBX, they didn't care too much about security. However, the hackers and the freakers were very interested in uh, dial-out capabilities and being able to basically make free calls on behalf of the corporation they were abusing. And as usual with telecommunication technologies, the vendors didn't want to take responsibility for security, and therefore the, their clients were exposed. Yeah, and what's funny is that they had the same behavior saying, hey man, this is a customer problem. It's his equipment, as his customer premise. He installed it. We don't care about that. In the end, of course, there was huge bill and dispute and stuff like that. It's exactly the same thing when you hear uh, botnet are the problem of our subscriber, not ours. And DDoS and through. OK, you know these things. Uh, kudos to Van Hauser, uh, who is recovering from, uh, I think, uh, a hard night last night for putting out this kind of uh, software. Uh, basically, Telco were the first victim of this kind of thing because they were the first user of their network. And of course, of course, there were also a lot of remote maintenance terminals in all the telco equipment, and this is still available today. You connect to some strange port, strange IP address, or sometimes through a modem, X25, and basically you reach a maintenance terminal that allows you to control a network element that's critical to the telco infrastructure. These things, we saw it 20, 30 years ago, and we still see it today. OK, anyone can shout a default login and password for this? No, Raul, you can't say. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now you can say it. Nobody is doing it anyway. Yeah, all. OK, 
tell us about some Oracle logins that you found not recently. Uh, not well, I mean, you still find hosts exposed on the internet with very stupid default passwords like Oracle, Oracle. For telco boxes, I mean, we're talking about value-added services platform that are running in the heart of the network, and they're exposed to the internet with a login prompt and an Oracle user with Oracle password. This shouldn't be seen even 10, 20 years ago, and we're still seeing it today. Okay, so some people still believe they are in Teletubbies world. Well, um, that's the naive stupidity kind of uh, uh, problems that you, you, we see. Uh, okay, then there's also a force, a dynamic that says, okay, what you have when you have millions of students who suddenly get cheap access to something new that can enable them to chat with some other people. Well, that's the Minitel, which was basically a great uh, invention in France, which basically motivated tons of people to get free access to their chat servers. And that created uh, quite a lot of people who got into the underlying hacking, X25 hacking. Yeah. And, uh Raoul, we use your slide because it's quite a cool one. The Iran PAC X25 network. We just wanted to briefly mention X25 because uh, most of you here probably don't know what it is. But in the early, uh, early days of hacking when internet access was not prevalent, then X25 was the way to go and was the way to access a lot of systems because X25 interconnected every country in the world. And uh, even though the lines were not free and access was not readily available, it was a great way to explore telecom systems, including weird countries like this one. Uh, it was readily available if you had a Minitel. That was also something interesting. So now we get out of uh, prehistory and uh, we get to mature kind of uh, golden age of uh, the telecom insecurity. So in um, that time, thanks to Captain Crunch uh, and lots of friends of his uh, uh, were roaming the international networks with their blue box. Um, the telco industry said, hey, uh, this is costing a lot, it's a lot of money, and on top of that, we can't trace the calls. So let's do something about blue box. So they invented SS7, which is Signaling System 7, the successor of CITT5. Yeah, go figure. We are just jumping from IPv4 to IPv6. Well, the actually, way. there was oh. a V6 version, but it was never put Dropped. live. Yeah. Like, history repeats. So basically, here, what you have is just the beginning of any call that even you do right now. When you're taking your phone and you're making a call, you're generating IAM, initial address message, onto the SS7 network. Now, just, just so you understand, there's a huge difference between the telecom signaling in Captain Crunch days where it was in-band, which means you had access to it as a user. With SS7, all the signaling network is out of band, which means you don't have access to it at all. It's completely closed. And this is why all the freaking died. However, as we're going to show you, it created its own sets of problems. Yeah, the thing is, um, with this, they said, OK, since we had bad people and we don't want bad people, let's make a closed network of SS7 operators who all trust each other. That's the model called the World Garden. Well, in the World Garden, there's only nice people. Right. So the thing is, in these days, protocol didn't need any kind of uh, anti-spoofing or any kind of cryptographic security. It's like a bit IP in the 1980s, except th things changed. In IP, what we know to do is to evolve. In telecom, uh, well, that's a bit of difference because right now, 99% of the internet, of the, I'm sorry, SS7 and telecom traffic in the world is still going through this. So you can easily do a denial of service by requesting maybe 100 million calls to 100 million numbers in America to 100 uh, million numbers in France. You just occupy the world address plan and say, okay, fill it up, provision some capacity between these two countries. And of course, what it does is a crash. So basically, all the denial of services that were discovered with IP haven't really been studied with SS7. And this is why they still apply today, because no real review by the vendors or the players has been, there hasn't been any serious attacks, at least not widespread ones. So here, basically, it's like, OK, now I want for 10 million euro loss per day the magnificent lack of attacker mindset. These people don't think that there can be attacker on SS7. Oh, now they start to realize that there are bad people doing something because, oops, network crash. 
what does a network crash, a network uh, mobile network operator crash cost per day? Direct cost, image, etc. So basically, they didn't think ahead and didn't adapt fast enough to change. Now, same way, uh, things evolved and you're all benefiting from uh, the fact you're roaming from your own country into Malaysia. And um, then suddenly you need to deal with prepaid. And one thing that happened is that since there's no perimeter defense, or uh, in 83% of the case in all network in telecom uh, SS7 network, there's no filtering at the perimeter level, at the boundary level. So basically, you can inject anything. And you can spoof, for example, a little message, which is called map, mobility application part, insert subscriber data, and you insert subscriber data into the mobile switch saying, oh, by the way, this guy who is roaming into your network is not really uh, a prepaid user, he's a postpaid user. So suddenly, I turn my subscription from a prepaid that needs to be validated call per call into a postpaid, which, well, he can consume as much as he wants. He's generating review. So here. And because there is a lack of authentication and access control with SS7 and that you can basically spoof messages from one network to another, you could also send normal messages like location update to make a, a network believe that a certain subscriber is in another country, for example, which will disconnect it from his home network. So you can do basically remote denial of service on any user on any network just by sending a few messages. So I was in India uh, talking to a telecom operator, a CTO, and uh, I said, yeah, here uh, on this thing, uh, you're, you're not filtering anything on your perimeter, on your interconnection that is bringing 100% uh, of your international roaming revenue. You're not filtering anything. And he turns to his corner network engineer and goes like this, what? We can do filtering on our uh, SS7 router, uh, which is called the STP? And the guy didn't even know you could do filtering, all right? Uh, there's not even a maturity like uh, the separation of routing and uh, firewalls. Uh, it's still the same box that does everything. And most of the times they don't even know they need filtering. <laughs> well, that was the case. So then we get into the marvelous countries uh, and times of uh, uh, 2000s and where we see a huge development of one kind of security. Yeah, so here we're going to change the topic a little bit and talk about another aspect of security, which is a little bit worrying. Uh, as we are showing you in this presentation, we're basically showing that there is a gap in the infrastructure operator security. There's a gap between what the vendor says, what the operators implement, and what the hackers can do. There's a huge gap, which means that most network operators are not secure. However, uh, there's a worrying trend from authorities, intelligence agencies, law enforcement to develop security techniques that are not really meant to protect you or your network, are basically meant to, well, to check what you're doing, to intercept your communication, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. So, um, oh, let me go back to one slide. This, this was just to basically explain what kind of parties are involved in an inter interception. Uh, as, as you know, there are two types of interception. There's a lawful interception, and then the other kind. The lawful interception is the one that is done by the authorities, and we're going to talk about that. It basically involves uh, court orders, warrants, and also all the technical capabilities of the operators, as well as the interface with the law enforcement authorities. Now, this kind of telecom interception is not new. I think it basically existed since telephone was invented. Uh, people wanted to know what you've been talking to each other. Uh, spying is not a, it's not a new profession. It's probably the second oldest profession. So how is it done in practice? In practice, nowadays, you have interception systems that are fully integrated in the, in the vendor equipment that is located at the operators. The vendors provide a facility which is called a lawful interception gateway, which is basically a platform interconnected to the switches and the network elements and that gather all the events in real time and send them to uh, law enforcement agencies. Now, ideally, those actions by law enforcement are under the supervision of a legal authority like a judge and court orders, warrants, subpoenas are required for interception. But as you can imagine, it's not always the case. Uh, the technical interfaces themselves are not that complicated. You need a certain bandwidth because you're intercepting voice traffic in real time, several channels. Uh, you can basically intercept absolutely everything, and we're going to talk about that. 
they're not only intercepting your phone call, they're also intercepting at the fiber optic levels. Now, you can imagine that to intercept a phone call, a judge could say, yes, there's a probable cause and we're going to intercept that subscriber. When you intercept fiber optics, uh, where a single fiber can carry tens of thousands of simultaneous calls, you, you have no such luxury. This is massive interception done at the tactical level. Um, we also have all sorts of uh, VoIP intersection, interception. Don't think that because you're making a phone call over uh, voice over IP, Skype, etc. Uh, now they have platforms, methodologies, and technologies to intercept very conveniently all your VoIP over IP traffic, including when it jumps from country to country, includes several providers, uh, complicated routing, etc. Uh, the, the development of the interception technology is fast growing and nothing has escaped uh, Big Brother, including the IMS, which is a next generation uh, infrastructure for telcos that also works with uh, voice over IP, SIP, etc. So uh, every time a new telecom technology is introduced, there's a new interception technology to basically so, so do some surveillance on what it's doing. By the way, uh, that was exactly this technology that was abused by backdoor into Ericsson Axe switches in Greece, in Athens, yes. when they snoop on uh, something like 100 key government officials from Greece. Now, interception is not only done at the carrier operator level, it's sometimes done at the handset level. Now, for example, this is a part of the brochure of an Italian company that says, sells what they call uh, remote control system, they sell that to government and intel agencies, and what it is is basically a sophisticated Trojan that they put on your computer and on your phone, and that intercepts everything and send it back to the law enforcement. Hopefully, as our friend will show, not all Italians are like that. Uh, obviously. Uh, but they seem to be very successful in selling their products to this law enforcement. This company, yeah, yeah. Yes, they are. Um, then we, we go to the highest level, which is <laughs> tactical I'm, interception. I'm tactical interception is what the military is doing. Um, they, they basically take the interception game to a whole new level, where they can basically intercept at the country level, at the city level. They can block entire area, you know, interdict traffic, jam, uh, replay, intercept, all sorts of things. And they have very sophisticated platforms that can do also all sorts of event correlation with other, uh, not only your telecom interception, but as we will see, um, other means like your, your, your social feeds, your email, your chat messages, it's, it, everything can be correlated to build a profile. Uh, this is just a picture of a, a passive interception system. Uh, passive means it doesn't, need, it doesn't need the cooperation of the mobile operator. Uh, in practice, it means you can intercept what you want without asking anyone. Um, so as I said, there are two types of interception. The lawful intercept, which is done through the facilities provided by the operator, or through your own equipment without the permission of anyone. Um, so this kind of interception systems they are deployed over cities, but they can also be deployed in, in mobile units to improve the precision. Uh, when they, they, they follow a target, they have to deploy those passive systems into the area of interest. Uh, the weakness of a passive interception system is that it needs to be located in the area of interception, as opposed to the lawful intercept gateway that can intercept anything from anywhere. Uh, one of the challenges that law enforcement is facing, and it's not only with uh, mobile phone calls and, and prepaid cards, etc., it's also with all, all the things that identify you as a person but you're using usually multiple identities on the internet. So they've developed platforms that can basically correlate those identities, do data mining, and, and paint a very precise picture of the individuals be, between, behind sorry, those virtual identities. Uh, everything is uh, intercepted in real time, including uh, IMAP, POP, of course the webmail as well. Um, the chat systems are intercepted. Those, those are real screenshots of real interception systems. So you can see that it's very user-friendly. You can zoom, click, correlate. Remember, the users are cops. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, I understand from the government perspective, they want to, they, they want to solve problems. And the problems of interception, uh, of course, they're justified by saying, yeah, we, we are tracking only terrorists and pedophiles and all those bad guys. But as we all know, it starts like that, and then it's used to intercept everything everywhere. 
Um, now, governments are always trying to solve problems, and uh, law enforcement is no exception. This is the current 10 challenges that they are facing at the moment, and I'm sure that once they've solved those challenges, they'll find the uh, next 10 ones. Uh, and every time you lose a little bit of your privacy, you lose a little bit of your right to be left alone on the internet, um, and this is only increasing. Uh, technically speaking, there are two things that are intercepted about your communication. Uh, what, what you're thinking, probably you're thinking about the voice content, you know, when you speak, your call is recorded, etc. but it's actually less frequent than the, what we call the IRI, which is the intercept related information, which is a lot more valuable for law enforcement. It's basically all the events that your phone generates. Uh, location updates, so we can know where you are, the SMSs that you send and receive, uh, the call records that indicate who you dial when, even when the person doesn't pick up the phone. Uh, all those events are recorded by the telcos and they're never deleted. So they provide a huge data mining for law enforcement. And there were a lot of uh, discussion about is the metadata, the traffic analysis on metadata, is really an infringement of privacy and needs to be sanctioned by a judge or not? And right now that's a lot of the debate in this area. Yeah. So uh, basically, the problem in there is, of course, maybe there's some privacy issue, maybe some uh, government are using their legal interception gateways in a wrong way. But for us, basically, as a security professional, the real problem is that when you ask some telco operators, are you doing security on your network, they're going to say absolutely yes. And they have plenty of security. They have fraud management, they have revenue assurance, they have IT security. They've got all that interception security, but there is a gap. Yeah, because if you ask what is doing interception security to really prevent some people from injecting packets into your core network, nothing. nothing. So the thing is, they just created successfully a $1 billion market for some companies to provide services to government, right? And now the real problem is that they're taking this excuse saying, we are doing the work investing in security, so how could we be insecure? And that's where actually all the normal important security questions go unanswered. Can I inject content? Is my uh, system that runs the telecom uh, network really resistant or robust and has been first tested? Is there a QA on security onto this equipment? All these questions, well, basically go unanswered. And it's a defocus of the management, uh, basically, attitude. So suddenly uh, you get the, um, the operator um, totally astonished to see that they sustain a two to three days denial of service, which prevents part or total communication during the attack with their uh, network, and basically they have nothing to protect it. I'm not speaking of having the equivalent of harbor networks kind of uh, BGP, null routing, or stuff like that at the telecom level. No, I'm just thinking, do you have something that can filter this traffic and let other traffic go through? They don't. So that's what happened in France, uh, where a mobile network operator got a DOS, like a simple equivalent of ping minus F, a ping fluid, uh, on, uh, on their network, on their SS7 network, and basically were taken offline. In this situation, it's still 83% of the SS7 network and SIGTRAN network, and now the evolution of that AMS and LTE, uh, which are vulnerable to these kind of things. So, then we start to see uh, a little bit of progress. Some people are actually asking themselves, well, there's some kind of uh, issue there. Uh, issue is this stuff can be used for cyber attack. It has impact on the economy. So what can I do? Um, next thing is that it's not requiring anymore to have these big uh, SS7 access that are super hard to get. Uh, by the way, plenty of these hacks were done by hacking into less developed countries uh, through the web interface of the operator, and then from remote country, and then from there jumping to the SS7 controlling node. Now, that's much easier. Uh, the marketing department just uh, pushed for the femtocell deployment into plenty of countries, which to the uh, network engineers uh, is a total heresy, because this thing uh, packs much more critical information and gives direct access through a VPN to the network to the core network of the operator. So once again, the operator goes like this. Look, eh, there's a VPN, a virtual private network protecting my entry to this. And you're like, yeah, who has the keys to this network? Well, it's in the femtocell. Oh, 
okay. And of course, the femtosal cell gets compromised. Here it was a Linux uh, with a quite a, like a two uh, or three vulnerabilities. Um, FPGA access, vulnerable boot, buffer overflow, insecure update mechanism of the firmware, you name it. So that thing, you, you'd say, okay, people are taking uh, consciousness of that, and then they are, are going to try to evolve and try to change. Well, that's the problem. In this industry, uh, the change is not as fast into the mindset of security management than into the attackers. So for example, you all know about VoIP catastrophes, like injecting VoIP, sniffing credential, sniffing voice, etc. okay? Now, with telco, there's a specifics. You want on interoperability, and uh, then with this marvelous interoperability, you have C plus SS7, which enable you to inject raw packets into SIP directly into the telecom core network. So of course, there, that means that you can do anything. Uh, the same kind of attack I said, but who can do SIP on the internet with a telco? Now it's everyone on the internet. These SIP trunks are easily discoverable. Okay, so 2010, we're getting in a new era, the era of cyber war, ready to cyber, sir. And uh, basically, uh, <laughs> we're going to see what that what takes us. So, now, yeah, th this, is, um, this is not a boring slide. This is a very important slide. This is taken from one of the very successful telecom vendors at the moment. I don't know if you, if you see it, probably a little, a little bit small, but it's basically their security documentation. And their security documentation is extremely detailed. It's very thorough. It covers every area of, of the network, its systems, uh, users, operating system, auditing, etc. Uh, you can see they've done their homework. They, they really have covered everything they could cover and why is it that still this doesn't mean the networks are secure? Uh, the problem is that the, the problem is the vendors are going to specify a certain set of security rules, but the operators are not going to follow them. Or if they do, they're going to follow only half of them because of operational constraints, because of marketing imperatives, decisions, because of the management that takes the business has bigger priorities and security. And it's also difficult to find the right skill set to implement telecom security. Uh, most people are familiar with IT security, uh, but when it comes to telecom security, with every vendor implementing its own proprietary interface, uh, very different uh, ways of managing network elements, it's, it's actually quite difficult, and the, the skill set required to do that is not widely available. So the operators have trouble finding the right guys to secure the network, and most of the time they're more interested in pushing new services and pushing new security systems. Now, let's, let's look at a few examples and see how the compromising uh, network infrastructure has, has wide-ranging implications. Now, this is just a little overview to show you the core network. The core network is where the switching takes place, is where we have uh, elements like the MSC, the mobile switching center. We have the SGSN, which is part of the data infrastructure. Uh, we've got the media gateway, we've got various interfaces, we've got the IP backbone. This is the heart of the network. Now, this is a very dangerous area for hackers and, and bad people alike to be roaming on. However, they are all controlled. If you see above, you see that OSS, Operation Support System, every telecom in the world is managed by an OSS. And this OSS, here, uh, this is just a functional view of all the interfaces that they are managing. The OSS is connected to absolutely everything. Uh, it's usually running on large Unix clusters, and it's connected with every network element, every single one of them. And as such, it can control all of them. Uh, this is just an example of the views. It has access to every parameter, every value, everything can be changed. Uh, so what, what, do you, what do you see? you've got a very complex infrastructure, a critical infrastructure that's managed by hundreds of people, by very complex teams, but you've got one system that can rule them all. The OSS can rule the radio network, as we see here, with the radio network controllers, the base stations. Uh, it can uh, control the switching environment. It can control the databases, like the HLR. Uh, it basically can see everything in the network, every alarm. There's nothing that is not controlled by the, by the OSS. 
it would be a great way to detect security events because as you can see, uh, the OSS, which is basically presenting alarms, is monitored 24 hours a day, and there's there are very strict procedures in network operators to resolve faults. So the problem is that security is not considered as a fault, so it never shows up on alarm screens. And what does it mean when you've got access to a system that can control everything? It means you can go everywhere on the network and make your own changes. Uh, here we, we're looking at an example of interception that leads to financial compromise. Uh, once you've got access to the network operator, once you've penetrated the infrastructure, it's very unlikely that you will be detected because they are usually in the heart of the network. There are no real security controls. So you're, you're able to sniff traffic at will. Now, the vendor of that particular solution in this example is a very well-known vendor for mobile money, and their brochure says that the solution is encrypted end-to-end. -end. They've got many different elements in that, in that system, databases, application servers, Tomcat, etc., and it's encrypted end-to-end. -end. Now, if it's encrypted end-to-end, -end, why is it that I'm able to get the PIN of the mobile money users? It's very simple, because we are sniffing the SIGTRAN part of the network. We are sniffing the SS7 traffic. The vendor never considers that. The vendor considered that SS7 traffic is secure or whatever they think. Uh, but we basically see the, the traffic. Those are, this is USSD traffic. You know, when you send those codes over your phone, uh, well, we can simply follow the TCAP transactions, reconstruct the traffic, and basically intercept a PIN code, which then we can use to conduct mobile money operation, empty people's accounts, and steal all their money. Uh, so it, it's, it's a shining example of why a, a secure solution, once deployed in a telecom uh, infrastructure, can be made insecure because of the SS7 traffic that can be intercepted. Uh, when we start digging into that mobile money service, we also notice that we get access to a lot of very confidential information. For example, the SIM number and the KI, which, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about cryptography of GSM again, but... Uh, this is what you need. This is basically the secret key and the, and the SIM number. You can use that to clone SIMs. And when you clone SIMs, you're going to use the clone subscriber account. Uh, we find credit card numbers, of course. We find PIN and blocking code. We find KI, clear text, encrypted. All those databases, they contain all this info critical information. Now, and one thing that is interesting is that when you talk to KI to telecom operators, they say, oh, yeah, it's secure. On the brochure, it says, only encrypted form of the KI will be displayed to the user. Yeah, but here we have database yeah, access. Yeah, exactly. On the database, we have both. So, and Same, every time they do banking, they have to follow the regulations. For example, the, the KYC, which is a know your customer, uh, requires operators to uh, generate reports. Those reports will contain names, will contain ID numbers, will contain mobile money account numbers. So the privacy implications of an operator getting compromised are, are, are huge. All your personal information is stored on those databases. And sometimes even the vendors themselves are not secure. This is an example. This is still the same mobile money vendor, and I've, I've hidden their name not to, to shame them, but they give each of their clients a software repository to update the infrastructure. Now, the client we were working on is masked out, but all the others we had access to them. We, were able, you know, we had access to Cellcom, CB Bank, DZ Bank, Telefonica, all those very important uh, banking and telecom operators. We could basically go in there, modify the software repository, and, and backdoor all their systems, intercept all their money. Uh, so it's, it's, it's unbelievable for a financial company that is deploying live financial services to an operator to make mistakes like that. And we see that all the time. And of course, uh, once you have compromised the mobile money system, it becomes a, a simple SQL query to add yourself money. So you basically, you can, you can you know, generate as much money as you want in your phone, and you can use it to pay stuff, transfer, etc. cetera. Uh, other information that are uh, in, in those telecom systems, when they have an LBS, you know, the location-based server, uh, then you can basically spy on everyone's location. Now, the, the mobile operators always know your location, but not always as precisely as you would think, because they only kept the cell ID and the location area code, and the accuracy of that in an urban area is about 100 meters. However, when you start to do triangulation, when you put timing advance in the mix, then the, the accuracy is, is greatly improved. And nowadays, of course, with GPS 
in, in your handset, you have even more precision. But this has uh, very sensitive national security and privacy implications when you can basically track where people are in real time. Um, when, when you compromise other systems, like for example here we're compromising the IN voucher system, uh, you're able to counterfeit money. Uh, the IN is the platform that runs the prepaid. The prepaid is, you know, the phone you've got in your pocket with that credit that you recharge. Well, that credit comes from vouchers, and those vouchers can be adjusted, or you can even print your own batch, which is the equivalent of printing money. Uh, you could print, you know, millions of vouchers. Uh, they would be recognized by the system, and the telecom would find out six months later what happened, if so ever. The, the problem about this is that they were used to that because all their employees were routinely checked and some were caught doing this kind of action. Now the problem is that we're seeing this stuff getting hacked remotely and then popping up on some underground forum to sell by thousands of dumps. This is a very important point actually. So Before it was all internal fraud, now we're seeing external attacks. The, the ecosystem of attackers have matured into some, some ecosystems that benefit not only from fraud, but benefit from security attacks, which is different. A fraud, you're going to mitigate it when it becomes too big. This kind of attack, it happens once, you're dead. You don't know which vouchers or which HLR uh, subscriber were compromised. Now, the SMS, as you know, uh, very often the SMS they are used with uh, one-time passwords, uh, secure authentication. Uh, you connect to your bank and they send you an SMS with a pin code or whatever that you used to log in and you think it's secure because yes, this is an out-of-band network. It's not the same channel as my authentication vector. It's got to be secure, right? I mean, it's encrypted over the air. The telco is secure, but no, actually, uh, you know, once you are in the telco infrastructure, the SMSC, which is a stored and forward platform, which means the SMS will be stored in a database at some stage, they can be easily intercepted in real time. So uh, all an attacker would have to do is basically intercept your PIN code in your, in your one-time password transaction and use it before you do to compromise the whole chain of, of uh, that so-called two-factor security. By the way, that's what Google relies on to secure your access. And in, you know, in the beginning, we spoke about remote maintenance terminal, and they are still all over the place in telecom infrastructure. There are many ways to access network elements. The most common way is what we call the ONM, operation and maintenance access. But there are other access, like remote maintenance terminal uh, that can be connected to remotely that have default username and password. Uh, not really documented, but that gives you access to all the disk, all the memory, basically full privilege over a critical network element just by issuing a little telnet command. Um, yeah. So, so there's a, a, a sort of thing that we call the legacy sandwich, uh, is that um, all technology has to be uh, then forward ported to new IP networks, etc. So they say, oh yeah, we had this modem access. Oh, well, let's have a serial converter to IP. And then you get access to some things that didn't even require login and password. And now are connected directly to IP. And sometimes not really well segmented, or maybe always. And this segmentation problem goes sometimes to very um, incredible uh, dimensions. For example, this one, we are able to connect through a single USB little mobile data um, modem. And then from there, oh, oops, uh, this IP address was part, of course, the IP address has been changed, uh, was uh, part of the RFC 1918 network that we were a part of. And we were able to connect to it. OK, so a class A network is still a big chunk to scan, even with lousy uh, uh, downscaled 3G connection, but it's totally doable. And by there, suddenly, oh, what can we get? Port 2905 uh, on SCTP, that means SS7 M3UA connection. And with that, we're able to do connection to the SS7 core network from a mobile connection, from the operator itself. Basically, you can inject your own messages just with this. So uh, the consequence of it is that you can do, once you have this kind of access, there's no limit on what you can do by injecting messages, okay? And this is still old technology, but you can access here through uh, these new access ways. So just by simple lack of filtering, there's this problem. Now, the only thing that was really limiting our attack is that this kind of network requires timing window so that if you don't receive in that many milliseconds the response to that message, then the message is canceled. But 
since we had sometimes lousy connection, the attack was not going through. But here, basically, that was not a security mechanism that was preventing you from doing that. It was uh, like availability or efficiency mechanism. Now, do not under underestimate the ability to inject your own SS7 messages, because as we explained during this speech, they are fully authenticated, fully access controlled, and there are techniques whereby we can shut down critical elements like an HLR using a few SS7 packets. It means it would shut down the entire network and you would be able to maintain the denial of service condition. Now, if you're able to shut down all the networks of a country, you've got a serious, um, serious problem. It's, it's strategic, it's very sensitive. Well, and it can be done economy, with a few packets using your mobile phone. So the big question for SS7 is, everybody is telling us, yeah, but how do you get access? Uh, it's very, very hard. Here we saw uh, definitely that with a simple uh, USB 3G modem, you, you could get access to some of it. Now, since you can get access to some of it, you can also get it easily by hacking other countries which are less protected than your own country, then jump into their core network and then spoof some traffic. Here, one interesting kind of uh, traffic that you can spoof is a uh, map message, which is forward access signaling. And this map message is directly a SS7 message that says, I'm sending you some raw packet. Treat it as if it, as it, if it was coming from the radio side. So then at the radio side, that means that you can inject any kind of signaling that comes from all the radio equipment. That means that you can do radio attacks without even being into the country. Okay, um, other stuff which is really funny is that sometimes um, some equipment manufacturer expose um, commons and say, yeah, with this you can do some, run some testing. Okay, and this one is unauthenticated. So you're like, Okay, if it's just testing, what's the point? And uh, what does it exactly do? It sends a pseudo message with your own pattern onto the wire. And basically, that sounds innocuous, right? So what happens is actually you can spoof any kind of message by injecting raw, arbitrarily chosen byte sequence that you send. So here, it's the people who are looking at us, it was just a test common. How should we know? They don't think with attacker's perspective. So um, even when they are confronted with some stuff, they are like, no, cannot exist. So in this case, around 2010, uh, there's a Caribbean uh, operator that noticed that his outgoing traffic to the internet is greater than its incoming traffic from its own subscriber. Hmm, fishy. And then they discovered that basically the normal customer traffic uh, of the customer was flowing to uh, the internet, but at the same time there was a copy of the traffic encrypted sent to uh, a known IP. All right. So this kind of thing means basically definitely backdoors and uh, that were confirmed into the equipment. So we start to see that even there's some uh, a very big compromise into the, the, the network. Compromise from the equipment vendor, possibly, or compromise from external attackers. Here, uh, that was really the turning point when in 2011 there was a, a, a basically a MNO that was attacked and the chunk of his HLR database, so everything you need to create card clone, was sold on the internet in inter underground forums. So that means really now there's some people actively remotely attacking and doing that. Um, then you could say, okay, um, this stuff is quite critical, so we really need to uh, uh, have some robust stuff. So the kind of software we are talking about here is a Nokia Siemens network HLR, so the heart of the network. And this stuff is basically usually a Sun Microsystems uh, front end with huge data back backends, and each of them is like huge. Like one time I, I go into a data center and say, oh, can I look at what we were successfully routed? And the guy say, yeah, it's like this rack, this. I'm like, oh yeah, this uh, 3U kind of thing. Looks at me, hey, what, like, like I'm stupid? He's like, no, it's this rack this wall rack and the wall ale on it and the, the, the series of rack behind is a hot spare, all right? These things are huge and yet they didn't even do some first testing onto their software stack in order to see if it was robust to random. We just sent random and this was crashing the machine, okay? So they need to believe that 
nasty things can be done and will be done on the network. It's not if, it's when. Some people is going to, for example, send some GTP uh, creation of, um, of GTP tunnel. So that's every time you go on data, pack, on data, uh, data session with your, with your mobile, you're creating this GTP tunnel, but you're not supposed to be doing it yourself. It's the equipment of the manufacturer. So what happened is that we found uh, on the one operator that it was easy to create, like in, um, there was insecure tunnel creation that was uh, still possible, and you could connect as anyone to any kind of, connect, uh, of network connected to the operator. And in there, there was one network which seemed funny, which was actually the geolocation M2M network for police, for these little uh, bugs that they put under the cars that are GPS connected with GPRS. And then we connected them to one of the machines that was supposedly uh, receiving a lot, of, uh, a lot of traffic. And basically, that was a Windows server that actually were collecting all the location of all the suspects with this little GPS tracker under their car. And then from there, hacked into it, basically an uh, insecure Windows machine, and so all the location of all the different suspects that were being tracked by this national police. So here, we're like, whoa, this is big. Then next thing we tested, can we do it with a normal phone? And actually, we could. And actually, what was even funnier is that when you took this little uh, GPS tracker, you could have uh, see the technical settings of APN and stuff like that onto this, this kind of thing. So you take out the SIM, put it into USB modem, and connect straight to the network as basically the person being tracked. So as a suspect, I could see all the other suspects. OK, right. good job. <laughs> okay. Direct implication of basically what, what can be done. Um, suddenly, you need these kind of little things to make the management jump, because as always, like, yeah, it's technical, I don't care. And one thing that was interesting is that we could do many type of different really bad stuff with GP, GTP tunnel and GPRS tunnel, but that got them really scared. What, you can spoof fake charges? You can pretend that someone uh, consumed something he didn't? And they didn't care even about denial service. They didn't understand that. But fake charging? Oh my god, this is important, okay? Money is the only thing that will keep them moving at the telcos, yeah. They only investigate when they lose money. Compared to that, uh, we had GGSN denial of service attack. With this, you can say, OK, I send you a denial of service packet. Basically, this packet is a very nice packet. It, it says, uh, you should go down because I think you're not going to handle the traffic well. And the GGSN goes, oh, all right. Then I will go down and shut down. And that's one packet, unauthenticated. If you create a GTP tunnel, you can do that. So management was not really um, interested by that. Then we really had to go to the next level. SGSN equivalent of this attack was actually sending the same kind of packet, but to the, or the one destined to SGSN. But then what you do is not denial of service on one network, is denial of service onto one part of the country. Because with this, you basically are sending a packet that says the SGSN, which serve all uh, west part of Paris, is going down. And OK, then they started to understand that there was a problem. Problem also is a problem of scope. The SGSN and GGSN are part of one very obscure network. Who has heard in this room about GRX? One person, two persons. OK. So GRX is basically what interconnects all GPRS networks. Yeah. This is In, why you charge so much when you roam. That's why there's even an option on your Android phone saying, uh, don't connect to data, mobile data when I'm roaming. OK? And this GRX network interconnects all the telecom operator at the packet level, at IP level. Well, with this packet that we have, since we've seen so many unfiltered access onto the telecom operator incoming connection to the GRX, then you could send this to worldwide amount of SGSN and basically DOS the world, right? So we are not talking about some theoretical attack. These things really go down, and they are really unfiltered, and you can actually test it with not much difficulty. Of course, you normally don't do that if you're on the good side. All right. So 
then you're like, yeah, but that was the past. Uh, now we are going to LTE, long-term evolution. We're going to have a much more IP-oriented kind of, uh, of networks. Well, what happens is that the LTE are actually very good technologies, much more IP-oriented with uh, lots of lessons learned. But the problem is that we still are into the walled garden approach. So there are still a separate zones, separate domain, which is still um, only allowed to network operators. And of course, well, there's time where you can actually uh, leak and I get access to actually the Evo Packet Core, which is the new uh, core network of the, of the operator. Uh, by the way, uh, these uh, networks still have a Solaris 2.6 box with default password and a uh, port mapper exposed. Hello. Okay, so what we see here is that, of course, um, there's a big telco uh, security problem of all this mindset of uh, world garden approach and yeah, it should be secure because I invest in interception and uh, blind trust into the vendor uh, or even overconfidence into their security like uh, no defense in depth. Yeah, people won't be able to do uh, GTP tunnel creation. Um, but the problem also is that uh, these organizations are very massive and not really uh, changing fast, okay? It takes them years to come up with uh, things and they are so confident that um, their own solution and the solution with a network uh, vendor is great that they won't listen even to the new guys, to the little uh, researcher who is uh, in the uh, far end of uh, Germany and uh, then he found something and he said, hey, I found something and they don't listen to him, okay? And sometime after two years, they're like, oh yeah, maybe we, we should listen to that. So the whole problem is that if you're not open to innovation and to independent security research, there's a huge problem because you're not going to get the early warning about these kind of issues and you're not going to be able to turn around this big chip fast enough. Um, one thing which is quite important is that um, there's a technology sandwich which is even going worse because we are still keeping the back the, the old technologies and going to new network technologies which are just accumulating layer on, on layer of technology. So you're just increasing your attack surface. Now, what we can do is we have a, quite a huge gap in between what is perceived as being security at the operator, like the operator does a lot of fraud management. Uh, you ask uh, to any person at the fraud management in usually what is called fraud and review assurance scheme, and they'll say, uh, okay, for example, you ask them, okay, explain to me what is uh, spoofing or what is a buffer overflow, and the guy will go like, oh, no idea. Because their job is to look at graphs that are generated from the financial data. They don't look at the raw signaling. They don't have IDSCs that do this job of detecting packets. Actually, since two years ago, it didn't exist. There was no IDS for SS7. So okay, there's a huge gap. We'll have to fix it. There's also uh, um, a huge gap into um, the way that the investment is driven. The investment is driven by some marketing department of some network equipment vendor. I'd say, oh yeah. Uh, interception will get you secure. Hello. It's actually the opposite. Interception is at getting an attack to confidentiality of some, uh, of some communication. Even if it's for the good guy, it's still an attack. So there's even also a problem is that the CEO very often discovers a problem and they're not, definitely not stupid people and CTO too. They're like just misinformed. Like the security experts in telecom security are very often uh, too few and not allowed to talk about anything. So in security, we don't have really, in telecom security, we don't have really conferences like this where uh, there's constant flow of information with the vendors. They are starting to get to this and that's what we are trying to, to push. Um, this low information is also uh, related to lack of tool. We are not having enough uh, tools because they are not investing into these things that are not well marketing. Marketed. Uh, the marketing power of Nokia or Huawei is going to be anyway so huge that any little startups that come and say, okay, we have a security thing, if Huawei and Nokia and Ericsson didn't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Ring the bell. So, so 
um, we have some, still some, some good improvement. Uh, one thing is that there are some open source that get into this domain. Uh, so we'll uh, definitely, uh, for example, single out uh, Osmocom group with Harald Velte and Sylvain Muno and all these people are doing an awesome job into opening these, uh, this domain. Um, and this is helping in order to first get the telco mindset to be changed, but also get raw data, raw people, like raw traces, information about is this secure or not. Also, the internet, like IETF, uh, all the standardization bodies of the internet side have quite won the standardization war, and 3GPP and ITU are uh, aligning to these new protocols. So that's also a positive step because we benefit then from all the mindset of security-oriented, attacker-oriented kind of protocol development. That's better because at least we have some people who, are, who know about um, the, the root of the security problem. Um, buzzwords also are helping when you hear critical infrastructure problems and attacks at the global scale. Of course, that's buzzwords and a bit bullshit. And to some extent, the operators are realizing that the infrastructure is critical and should be protected. It doesn't happen everywhere at the same time, but we see some operators that are really making the right moves. Because that actually tickles them. They're like, oh, I heard words that really hurt my ears. So actually, this is still helping. And then, in the end, we have a few early adopters in the telecom world that are really getting for it. So there's a telecom operator where the pen test is, oops, OK, we have a default password with a uh, remote route, uh, then uh, uh, compromise, and these kind of things. And some others are super tough. So early adopters are a bit driving the market. And I believe that these people are uh, going to survive a bit better than their competitor. Uh, so these are really adopting the modern uh, telecom, uh, the modern uh, security in telecom, and showing the way. Um, let's uh, hope and push that uh, this is the same case uh, everywhere. And uh, I hope uh, to maybe meet you to to discuss that uh, person to person. Questions? Yeah, yes, John. Captain. Um, okay. Can we get a mic? Yeah. Yes, mic. it's coming. OK, um, we all know that Skype is not very secure as far as personal communication goes. Um, so uh, wait, wait, what did you say? You said we Skype. All know. Skype that is Skype is not very secure. Yeah, well, especially since yeah. Microsoft bought it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's for sure. There goes a the neighborhood. <laughs> um, so let's say I give myself an SSH connection to a SOX proxy SSH tunnel, and now my IP address is somewhere in the USA, and all of my traffic goes through the SSH protocol, which is secure. How, how safe is that? I've often wondered that. Okay, That's you're my pro question. proxying all your communications yeah. through a remote proxy. An SSH tunnel proxy. Yeah, yeah. so basically you're shielding your origin, yeah. but if you have vulnerable code into your... your well, not uh, only am I shielding my origin, but I'm also, aren't I also encrypting my data? Yeah, is that, well, is that okay. pretty safe? W what would you want to, um, to protect yourself from? If you want to protect yourself from uh, legal interception, then uh, yes, that could help. If you want to protect from uh, like intelligence uh, collection, uh, then no, because the goal is to, to collect as many uh, backbone data as you want. And as if you, want. you use a VPN provider to have your outgoing encrypted connection, yeah. do you trust the provider? Yeah, that's if you a make it question. yourself, of All course. All of these, of course, are important issues. Yes, of course. Right. Uh, if I was an SA, the first thing that I do is I'd uh, definitely create a company which is providing free or cheap uh, VPN termination. And, uh, like but it's a very good point. I mean, cryptography is the answer to many of the privacy and interception problems. And it works with IP the same way it works with telecoms. I mean, you, I was telling you that SMSs can easily be extracted and intercepted. But if you don't want your SMS to be read, you can encrypt them. For example, using Tech Secure and Android uh, yeah, from Moxie. Well. Moxie uh, there's, a, there's a few uh, applications like that. Yeah. Voice, VoIP traffic can be encrypted as well. So yes, cryptography is always part of the solution. Um, it's not a 100% foolproof solution because you have many things to consider, but it's definitely the way. Well, like they say, locks are to keep people honest. Yes, exactly. So don't forget to watch uh, Captain Crunch presentation, John Draper, tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Is it this afternoon, right? This afternoon, this afternoon yeah. And he's going to give you a lot more detailed view on the 
uh, freaking and the early telephone hacking, okay. and I'm sure it's going to one be fascinating. One mic to, the, to Emerson. One more uh, question there. Yeah. Oops, hello. This isn't really so much as a question to you. I was, I was watching your talk, and uh, I've decided that I've, I've written a three-point evil marketing plan for uh, telco security. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is, this, they, they showed us. <laughs> well, so uh, um, what we do, you see, is we uh, find a country that uh, is uh, nominally a U.S. enemy. Uh, we DOS the entire infrastructure of the country. All the Western operators then subsequently panic. And uh, yeah, loads of money for everybody. Okay, you you'd, be to surprised do that. How, you'd be surprised how close we are to that situation yeah. already. The, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you don't need to do that because some people are actually doing attacks. And the thing is, in this industry, people don't talk. It's not like a, there's not yet the full disclosure epiphany, right? They're you still like, hear about it. you never hear about this stuff. Yeah. Trust me, it happens. Yeah, I think so. No, 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 well, no, 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 you're wrong. Because actually money. they know about that. They know about a, GS, a GSM association is communicating these facts to all the operators that are part of the security group. But the thing really that hurts them is if it gets the press. And they're controlling the event, they, it doesn't go to the press, nothing happens. They prefer to get a 100 million loss, 100, USD, 100 million USD loss, uh, and not have it go to the public rather than cut it by two by maybe finding the origin or, or doing uh, any it, kind of negotiation but and having is, it to the public. They it, want to stay perceived as secure. Yeah, but it is changing. As we said, there are, some of the operators are maturing and some of the attacks are getting them awake indeed. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that's the thing. It, it, and that's what we're changing. We're Stamping. moving from uh, fraud kind of uh, programs, which are still manageable. Oops, I got 10 million of my uh, money. It's still manageable for them. Two problems when you have to renew your entire SIM card park. You know, the, the whole pool, you're dead. But okay. it's, it's like with IP, you know, in the beginning, maybe most companies didn't think they needed a firewall. And once denial of service attacks and global hacker attacks got publicized, you know, like 20 years ago when it started, then people the awareness rose for those products. And it's going to be the same in telcos, just with a shift. OK, I think this is the end. Uh, any last minute question? OK, thank you very much, guys. Thank um, you for your time.